it's always such a joy to see what communities can achieve for their environment when they work together. We've got a lot of reports about the positive impact of collective action on the show today. I am Chris Alems in Lagos, Nigeria. Great to have you with us. Here's what's coming up. A unique community-driven agroforestry system in Ethiopia. Why citizens of South Africa are gathering data about water quality. And in Gambia, we meet some activists standing up against pollution and overfishing. But we start in Ghana, like in many other places around the world, lots of people from Ghana choose to study and work abroad. It can be an enriching experience and open up countless opportunities. But when too many skilled professionals leave their home country, it can have a massive impact on innovation and growth, especially in sectors that are vital to sustainable development. So what is being done to stop this brain drain? Every little detail is important. William Asamoah is putting his invention to the test. The engineering students want to help Ghana's farmers by cutting the cost of using solar power. What I'm doing is building an inverter for, so, uh, for pumps, for AC pumps, for solar power irrigation. Contrary to the DC power irrigations that are expensive. This is what will make it easy for farmers to buy and maintain. The power of the sun might be free, but farmers currently have to dig deep in their pockets if they want to run water pumps from that energy to adjust the electricity currents, they require transformers, for example, which can cost some 1,500 US dollars in Ghana. As a most invention does away with the need for transformers. This is the, they buy our inverter and they buy an AC pump and solar panels and they are good to go. This makes it cheaper than the existing solar power irrigation system. Ghana needs engineers like William Asamoah. But according to estimates, some 70,000 skilled professionals leave Africa each year in search of a better future elsewhere. The RCAs, the Regional Center for Energy and Environmental Sustainability in Western Ghana, is trying to help stop that brain drain. Today, master students are learning how to manage peak power consumption and avoid electricity outages. The RCS is one of the World Bank's higher education centers of excellence in Africa aimed at delivering high-quality training and applied research. The idea of establishing these centers of excellence is to have these students train within the country. And before you can do that, you have to make sure that the quality that they get at home will be compared to the quality that they get when they go outside. So far, 90 PhD and some 200 master students have graduated, making it a top choice for students like George and to pursue higher education locally. Students here are very practical and they are actually making a lot of things. So some students here make inverters for solar PV, others do softwares for energy management systems, and people, uh, people some students also do something relating to forecasting. And it's the same thing they are doing, my friend is also doing in the UK. Because they talk of really about practical, practical aspects of it. And it's nothing different here. In the past, things were different. Ofosu Entry, the director of the center, felt he had to leave Ghana and go abroad in order to get good education. I was trained at a cost of about 110,000 euros in Holland for my PhD. But then you can use $25,000 to $30,000 to trade a PhD student in Ghana. So that money that was used to train me alone can train four people in Ghana. So this is how the whole concept is. So when now we train the people within Ghana or within Africa, you retain them, the numbers increase. Today, students from the Institute are being put to the test they are going to inspect the regional electricity generating company's power distribution system and consider how it could be improved. And the upcoming engineers already have an idea how Ghana could reduce power losses, save costs and improve the grid stability. One thing that they could do is to take the grid 
onto a DC, high voltage DC transmission, which has been trialed around the world. The current grade architecture, which is using AC system, is not efficient enough. So we recommend that they transit to the high voltage DC, which is very efficient. That is just an idea for now, but Ghana's first Bluetooth solar farm went into operation in June 2024, based in part of research results from the center the West African country aims to produce some 10% of its electricity from renewables by 2030. The solar plant on the Bui Reservoir will play a role in that. Experts say if highly trained students like this are to be retained in Africa, then salary levels will also have to rise. The whole issue that fuels brain drain is about remuneration. Okay, so if you have the jobs, uh, the jobs uh, paying us, we should be paid. So if government invests in the creation of jobs, it should also come with good pay so that people f see the need to stay back. Even if I'm saying I'm going outside and I'm going there to work, who stays back to develop our country here? In the end, we have to come back and contribute to the development of our country. William Asamoah believes yeah, that in the future his invention will help improve the lives of Ghana's farmers, as well as generating enough income for himself. The institute is now helping him to launch his invention on the market. You may be amazed to see what communities in Northern Ivory Coast are accomplishing through collective action for the environment and beyond. Now, have we picked your curiosity? Well, here comes the women of Nanka Kumina. A quick check to ensure they have enough provisions. Then these members of a women's cooperative set off on a 15-kilometer journey. The terrain in this part of Ivory Coast can be quite rough, especially during rainy season. But even swollen rivers can stop the women. Upon arrival, they collect nuts from shear trees, which they'll turn into shear butter. It is used in cooking and cosmetics and sought after on the world market. But the women find scenes of devastation too, even though this is a protected forest. Farmers have cut down trees to plant fields or strip them to sell their bark. In traditional medicine, shear bark is used to treat malaria and stomach aches. But without bark, the trees dry out and die. Many of these women once sold tree bark too, but now shea nuts provide them with a more environmentally friendly source of income. Since we joined the cooperative, we've completely stopped cutting bark. We used to cut a lot. Sometimes we even hurt ourselves while removing it. And without their bark, the trees die. So now we do everything we can to protect the trees. In 2021, a center to process shea nuts was set up in the village of Wadere Madualaso. Some 200 women work here in a cooperative called Nanka Umina, or We Stick Together. The cooperative has struck a purchase agreement with a Ghana-based company that aims to empower women in this region. As it is harvest season, the women gather and dry as many nuts as they can. Later, they'll cook them to make shea butter. The cooperative has been organic certified. Its processing facility cost around 60,000 euros, most of which came from the international donors, including the EU. Last year's entire production has been almost completely sold. All the women in the village are pleased. Before, we were always traveling right to the border with Liberia to sell tree bark. We had to leave our husbands and children behind. Now we can stay in the village with our families. We have work and our own money, so we're happy. The partner firm, Savannah Fruits Company, has a regional office to handle the cooperative's shea butter. International sales are going well thanks to the Shia Butters organic certification. Centralizing production on one site was key to the process.
Habituellement, les femmes, the elles women used to bring their shades back from the bush and store maison. them in a corner Et in their house. It was usually the place where they stored chemicals for fertilizers for their fields, or where children would play. The women also processed the nuts at home. They also processed the nuts at home. But the quality suffered. There was too much contamination. There was too much contamination when they tried to do it all at home. There was too much contamination when they tried to do it all at home. There was too much contamination when they tried to do it all at home. There was too much contamination when they tried to do it all at home. There was too much contamination when they tried to do it all at home. There was too much contamination when they tried to do it all at home. There was too much contamination when they tried to do it all at home. There was too much contamination when they tried to do it all at home. There was too much contamination when they tried to do it all at Regional center of Dabakala, there is still a brisk trade in tree bark and roots used in traditional medicine. At least two big truckloads live here each week, bound for Ivory Coast's financial capital, Abidjan. Naminata Watara used to sell tree bark here and was often away from her family for long periods of time. Now that she is a member of the women's cooperative, that's no longer necessary. She can also afford to buy better food for her family and invest in fish. We come here every Wednesday, when it's market day in Dabakala. Before we never had enough money, but now it's better. I was able to buy two crates of fish that I can resell in the village. Through the project, we received 10,000 francs and I used some to buy vegetables. The extra food is a welcome contribution. Naminata Uotara's husband, Bele, grows yam and cashew nuts. His other wife also works in the cooperative, and since both women now earn more money, Bele's respect has grown. My wives help me buy a sheep for Tabaski, a feast of the sacrifice, and they contributed to the purchase of some cattle. My wives have also really helped me to pay for school fees, so I recognize the value of the co-op. The women are gaining influence in other areas. They often come across fields of yams and cashew nuts illegally planted by local men in their collecting zones. Now, the supervising NGO has allocated them a 30 square kilometer area, which is off limits to anyone but the cooperative. The women who earn their living gathering shay nuts in this area won't allow their husbands or any other people to come in here and plant crops. Our plan is to certify the largest possible area as a biodiversity zone. That will help us to more effectively protect this land and enable its restoration. The shade trees bring us respect, and in return, we protect them. Now the villagers respect us and value our work. It's work that not only protects the forest, but also helps women and their families, proof that environmental protection can benefit everyone. When people pull together for the good of a group, a lot can be achieved. In South Africa, citizens are helping out scientists by collecting data about their water quality. Drinking water is highly regulated in South Africa, but the quality has deteriorated in certain areas, especially more rural ones. With these communal efforts, they hope to address the country's water issues. This water looks clean enough, but at least once a year, Ferial Adam takes samples to check for bacteria infestation in Johannesburg's Emerentia Dam. E. coli is particularly common and extremely dangerous. If it turns black, like that, it's positive for bacteria. So it's, it's a whole range of bacteria. It's, it's the E. coli, it's the, you know, coliform, which is from dead plants, animals. The additional petrifilm test takes 36 hours and confirms the presence of E. coli bacteria, which probably got there from an overflowing sewer. Water pollution is an increasing problem in South Africa, with sewage often flowing from homes and factories into lakes and rivers with little or no filtration due to dysfunctional infrastructure. And the problem is exacerbated by heavy rainfall and other extreme weather events. The data that the authorities do regularly publish on water quality is too general. 
which is what prompted Ferial Adam to set up Watercan three years ago, an organization that enables residents to do their own tests. The difference with our kit is it gives you localized information. So this point, this stream, this community is tap water, and that was the difference. Because when you look at the results that's been submitted to national from local government, it doesn't specify where, it gives you an overall result. Local water quality is a vital issue for people like Clebilo Masika living in the Val region. It's home to a range of mines extracting heavy metals, which other water can tests can detect too. The problem that I saw is that we have um, Asenamita is the biggest giant a, a politi- a, a industry. There is a drainage storm that is running through to the streams. So we have to test that water because we are no longer getting fishes there. The tests are provided by Watercan at low cost and free of charge for schools or people on modest incomes. Cleaner water for all means, the more citizen science activists, the better. Let's be informed as ordinary people. Let's create that noise about the pollution. Because when you create that noise, you start forcing change and people start realizing that they have to be part of the solution. Gambia has a fairly short coastline and communities there face the threat of overfishing. A recent report by Amnesty International revealed that it is one of six African countries that together lose at least 2.1 billion euros annually due to illegal or unregulated fishing. At the same time, local fish meal factories are having a damaging impact on marine ecosystems and the people who depend on them. We met some local activists to find out more. The coastal town of Sanyang has a problem. Every day, fishers unload almost their entire catch here to be taken by truck to a nearby factory where it's turned into fish mill. It's been like this for six years, and both people and nature are suffering the consequences here in southwestern Gambia. That's something environmentalist Mohamed Jabang and his fellow activists are determined to change. Ever since the factory was built, they've been calling for a more sustainable use of their region's resources. The marine economy or the blue economy is very important for our survival here as a community in Sanya. Because, I mean, we solely depend on fish. Overfishing by large trawlers is creating havoc all along the coast of West Africa. 90% of these vessels are foreign-owned. Gambia is among the countries affected. For a few years now, some of these trawlers have been delivering their catch to Sanyang's fish mill factory. The fish mill is exported to China. It takes 4.5 kg of fish to produce 1 kg of fish mill. In order to work efficiently, the factory needs 500 tons of fish every day and only large trawlers can deliver such quantities. That leaves local fishermen with even less to catch. Currently, we can't fish a lot in the sea because of the presence of the big boats from Senegal, posing significant challenges for us. We urgently appeal to the government to intervene. They are depleting the fish population, and if this trend persists, there will be no fish left in the Gambian waters within the next two to three years. The fish mill factory pays the local fishers the equivalent of six euros a crate, which is a decent local price and guarantees them a dependable business. But it leaves little over to sell as food at the local market. Overfishing is, is a problem here in China. So many fish been caught and very few at the market because I mean, the way they are fishing is not sustainable. Because whatever we are doing as a, as a country in the Gambia, we need to first check the sustainability aspect of it. Because yes, fishes have been producing the sea, but we deserve that they have been caught. It's not sustainable. It's really affecting the people in Sanya. And there is not just that. The chimneys have been pumping out smoke day in, day out for the last six years. Air quality has dropped, and the smell is overpowering. The more factory was starting to go, and go. The nauseous stench emanating from the chemicals severely pollutes the air to the extent that residents must retreat indoors even just to enjoy a simple meal in order to escape the pollution discharged by the factory. The factory isn't just polluting the air, it is pumping its water waste directly into the sea and that's having an impact on the fish. 
Mohamed Jabang and his association have been protesting against the pollution since it first became apparent. They were arrested. But at least the factory was forced by the National Environment Agency to bury the overflow pipe under the sand. The environmental activists are now trying to bring about change via dialogue. But neither the fishing community, the factory operators, nor the government officials were prepared to talk to DW about it. The fish mill factory may provide a reliable income for fishers, but it encourages them to overfish. Mohamed Jabang is trying to get them to use more sustainable methods to protect nearshore fish stocks. Some fishers have listened and no longer fish in spawning grounds and throw young fish back into the water. Among the key pillars of our existence is from every activity or before any activity, we call on each other and our fellow youths and other individuals within the community so that we can have a dialogue. As well as raising awareness, the activists go to the beach once a month together with volunteers to collect plastic waste. They know that such efforts are just small steps, but they help to keep them going. As the world around us changes at such an alarming rate, people often need to get creative and find new ways to adapt. But sometimes it's the ancient tried and tested methods that can help the most. Our next report takes us to Ethiopia where an indigenous community protects its forest with a system that has been around for hundreds or maybe even thousands of years. As they proceed through the forest, the elders sing their praises to God Mineko. They are giving thanks to the forest for their people's well-being and for the protection of the forest. In the Gedeo culture, the forest is revered like a human life. According to our traditional law, not a single tree can be felled without prior community consultation and consent or without planting new saplings for each tree that's cut down. The elders pay a visit to every family in the forest. In Gedeo culture, coffee is a symbol of hospitality and respect. The visitors get the family's latest news, but they also inquire whether there have been any unusual happenings, for example, if there has been any illegal logging nearby. <laughs> If there is anyone felling trees and violating this order, he has to go before the assembly of elders called Songo, and he is advised not to bring hunger on us by cutting down the trees. The Gideo people are an ethnic group in southern Ethiopia. Up to 1.5 million people are estimated to live on an area some 1,200 square kilometers, which make it one of the most densely populated regions of the country. Large parts of the Gideo zone, as it's called, are forested areas, which are conserved by traditional knowledge and practices. The Gideo people's spiritual connection with nature dates back to prehistoric times. Located on their territory is Odola Galma Rock. Its animal depictions, which probably represent cattle, are about 3,000 years old. Large standing stones symbolize fertility and growth. They play an important role in community ceremonies. Some also mark graves. Wood that's been illegally logged, chopped down for firewood, and forest cleared to create new fields. Neither can be completely prevented, even though the Gideo community's punishments are draconian. If he does not change his ways or accept advice from elders, he will be punished with social sanctions. The whole community punishes him by excluding him from social events. Gideo-style forest conservation doesn't just work due to social pressure, but also because of sustainable agriculture. Farmer Yitagusu Tesfaye and his family live in the middle of the forest. Here they cultivate Yoga Chef coffee, which is hailed as one of the best coffees in the world. Papaya and sugar cane also thrive here. Growing several different types of plants together helps preserve the fertility of the soil and cut the risk of soil erosion. The forest always comes first. <laughs> We, the Gideo community, before we do agricultural work in the forest, we make sure that the condition of the forest 
is protected. A small colony of bees produces honey. It's another source of income for the family. Many people here earn their living like this. The total productivity of the area is very high. This is a secret of that this amount of people are bees living here in sustainable manner. In 2023, UNESCO made the Gedeo cultural landscape a World Heritage Site in recognition of the people's ancient agroforestry practices. These customs are derived from the community's great respect for nature that they hold sacred. That's all for today. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the show. So feel free to reach out to us at eco at dw.com. You can also find more inspiring stories by searching for Eco Africa online. Thanks for tuning in and goodbye from me, Crystal Lems in Nigeria. See you next time.